Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. So today I'm looking a little blue. We got the blue crop hoodie on, blue shirt on, blue nails going on, but we are certainly not feeling blue because today we are going to be doing the top five hardest questions from SAT practice test number three, the math section, in particular, the calculator section. So without further ado, let's get cracking on those questions. Alrighty, so we are first going to begin with question number 26. So they tell us in the question, the line determined by the points 2 comma K and K comma 32 passes through the origin and we're asked for a possible value of K. So first and foremost, we definitely need to be aware of the fact that the origin refers to the point 0 comma 0. And when I'm seeing all of these points, the first thing I'm thinking of is finding out what the slope is. So the slope formula, this will not be provided, so you definitely have to have this memorized, is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So you might initially be tempted to try to find the slope of the two points that contain k. Let me show you though why that really wouldn't be helpful at all before we actually do this the right way. So if we tried finding the slope, let's call 2x1, we'll call k, this k, y1, and then we'll call this k, x2, and then we'll call 32, y2. So that would give us 32 minus k over k minus 2. And as you can see, that really doesn't help us at all here because we have a k in the top and the bottom. So that really isn't giving me much information at all. So that's going to be a dead end. But what we can do is we can try to find the slope of the line formed by 2 comma k and 0 comma 0 because we know that those are two points on the line. So let's find the slope of 2 comma k and 0 comma 0. We'll call this x1, this y1. We'll call this x2 and this y2. So the slope then would be 0 minus k over zero minus two, so that comes out to negative k over negative two, which is just k over two. So we found the slope of two comma k and zero comma zero. Now we're gonna go ahead and try to find the slope of k comma 32 and zero comma zero. So we'll do k comma 32 and zero comma zero. Again, let's call this one x1, y1. We'll call this one x2, y2. So we get zero minus 32 for the slope, the top, over zero minus k. So that comes out to negative 32 over negative k, which is 32 over k. So the reason why I found the slope for each of these combinations is because I know that this is the slope of the exact same line. So these two slopes then have to be equal to each other. So now I can go ahead and set these two equal and we can find out what the value of K is. Let's go in red. So K over two is equal to 32 over K. Let's go ahead and cross multiply that. We get 64 is equal to K squared. So taking the square root of both sides, we get that K is equal to plus or minus eight. So a valid solution then would be eight, which we can see is choice C. Woo! Alrighty, so next up we have number 27, which is a percent question. We know them, we love them. Hopefully we'll love them at least after I show you how to do this. So they tell us a rectangle was altered by increasing its length by 10% and decreasing its width by P%. percent. If these alterations decreased the area by 12%, what is the value of P? Okay, so two things we got to know. So percent increase, how to model that, and how to model percent decrease. So to model a percent increase, we take the percent and we add it to 100. So it's 100% plus the percent that we have. And percent decrease is we take 100% and from that we subtract the percent that we're working with. So basically, if we know that the length increased by 10%, that means that the length is 100% plus 10%, so the length is equal to 110% what it was. And then if we know that the area decreased by 12%, we'll put that into the percent decrease. So the area then is 100% minus 12%, so that gives us 88%. 
All right, so we know that the area of a rectangle is represented by the length times the width. So we know already that for A, we can plug in 88%. For L, we can plug in 110%. And for W, they just said P percent, so I'm just gonna put P percent in there. So we don't know what that is, that's what we're trying to find. So we can go ahead then and divide both sides here by 110. And let's pull out our handy dandy TI-84. So 88 divided by 110, that gives us that P percent is equal to 80%. So 80% though, I'm not seeing that as an answer. Well, look what the question says. It says that it decreased by P percent. So what we can go ahead and do to find the percent decrease is we can take 80 and we can plug that into what the percent is up here. So we know then that the percent decrease is equal to 100% minus 80%. So the percent decrease then has gotta be 20%, which is choice C. Woo! All right, so the next question, I'm sure you were wondering, what's the next one after 27? Boom, math trick, it's 28. So let's check out number 28. So this is an exponential word problem and people struggle with these quite a lot. So let me show you how to do them. They're actually not that bad if you just follow this technique. So they give us all of this background information, blah, blah, blah. They tell us though, the important part, the population of the city will decrease by 10% every 20 years, and that the initial population is 50,000. That's the population right now. Okay, so what that means then, I wanna draw a little uh, timeline here. What that means then is that right now, year zero, no years have passed, the population is 50,000. After 20 years, the population is going to decrease by 10%, meaning that the population is going to be, let's see, 45,000. And then same thing would apply in year 40. It will again decrease by another 10%, so that would give us 40,500. Okay. So let's first just remind ourselves a decrease of 10%. As we said with the last problem, a percent decrease can be found by subtracting the percent from 100%. So 100% minus 10% gives us 90%. So 90%, we don't see that in any of these choices, but 90%, in order to rewrite that in its decimal form, all that we have to do is take the decimal point and move it over two places to the left. So we get 0 0.9. So automatically we can go ahead and knock out choices A and B because those have 0.1, not 0.9. Okay, so we know then that after 20 years, the population needs to be 45,000 as we discussed up here because 500,000 times the 0.9 is gonna give us 45,000. So we wanna see which equation C or D is going to represent that. So if we plugged in T is equal to 20 years, so we're gonna plug in 20 in place of T, that would make this exponent right here 20 times 20, which is 400. So 0.9 raised to the 400th power times 50,000, I mean, look at, how small that number is. That is certainly not the answer of 45,000 we were looking for. So obviously it's gotta then be choice D, but let me show you why. Notice when we plug 20 in for this exponent, that becomes 20 over 20, which is basically just equal to one. So technically this equation then is just 50,000 times 0 0.9, which gives us the 45,000 that we were looking for as the population after 20 years. So exponential word problems can seem a little bit tough, but if you just follow this procedure, you are guaranteed to get them right. So number 29, obviously, is just a really short, casual kind of question. You know what I mean? Just like two lines. Um, my sarcasm, I hope that you guys appreciate it. So it looks like there's a lot of stuff, but it's actually not that bad when we just break everything down into variables. So they tell us in the question that there are five times as many right-handed female students as there are left-handed female students. Okay, so let's go ahead and call X. Let's say that that represents the number of left-handed females. 
Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and plug that in here for X. So they tell us then that there are five times as many right-handed females, so that means that for the right hand, we can plug in five X. And then the next part of this problem, they tell us there are nine times as many right-handed male students as there are, sorry, nine times as many right-handed male students as there are left-handed male students. Okay, so what that means then, let's call Y the number of left-handed males. So what that means then is that the left we will call y, and if there are nine times as many right, we would call the right nine y. So they tell us that, we already know this though, as per the chart, there are 18 left-handed and 122 total right-handed. And then we're asked for the probability that a right-handed student selected at random is a female. Okay, so what I'm thinking right here, I'm seeing two variables, two equations. So I'm thinking system of equations. That's what we're gonna have to set up here. So we know then from the left-handed column that X plus Y is equal to 18. And we know then from the right-handed column that 5X plus 9Y is equal to 122. So in order to knock out one of these variables, we're going to use what we call the elimination method. So in the elimination method, we multiply one of the equations by a certain constant in order to knock out that variable when we add the two equations together. So watch this. So I'm going to multiply the entire top equation here by negative five. So then the top equation will become negative five X minus five Y is equal to, let's see, five times 18 is equal to negative 90. And then the bottom equation is five X plus nine Y is equal to 122. So the reason I selectively multiplied that top equation by negative five is that, so when I added these two equations together, the X's will cancel out because negative five X plus five X, that's just going to cancel out. So we're left then with four Y is equal to, 32, so divide by four, y is equal to eight. So now we can go ahead and fill in the table. All right, so if we know then that y is equal to eight, let me just go ahead and erase this. So if y is equal to eight, we're gonna be in pink. That means that this is eight, and then the x has gotta be 10 here because we know then that 10 and eight has to sum to 18. Five times 10 would be 50, and nine times eight would have to be 72. So they ask us the probability that a right-handed student selected at random would be a female. So that would be 50 out of the total of 122 right-handed students, which comes out to 0.4098, which we could see will round to choice A, 0.410. Now for the last question, number 30. So we are told that B and C are constants, meaning they're just numbers, we don't know what they are. If B is equal to C minus one half, which of the following is true? So looking at the choices, they're expressing this in terms of words, but let's actually write what they're saying in terms of equations. So X is equal to Y minus one over four, X is equal to Y minus one half, x is equal to y minus one, or x is equal to y plus one half. So I know then that I have to get x in terms of y to express my final answer. So let's go ahead first. We know that we have some relationship with b and c. So let's go ahead in each of these two equations, let's isolate b in the top one and let's isolate c in the bottom one. So if we have 3x plus b is equal to 5x minus 7, to get b alone, I'm going to subtract 3 from both sides. So I find then that b is equal to 2x minus 7. Let's go ahead and isolate c in the bottom one. So if 3y plus c is equal to 5y minus 7, subtracting 3y from both sides, I find then that c is equal to 2y minus 7. So we know though up here, they were so kind as to provide us with the fact that B is equal to C minus one half, which we can express alternatively 
as b is equal to c minus one half in equation form. So I can go ahead now and plug in right here in place of b, I can plug in c minus one half, and I know then that that's equal to two x minus seven. I'm going to add one half to both sides. I am personally more of a decimal girl, so I like to think of one half as 0.5. So that gives me C is equal to 2X minus 6.5. So now I have C set equal to two different things. So now I can go ahead and set 2Y minus 7 equal to 2X minus 6.5. And I know then I have to get X in terms of Y. So I'm going to keep that in mind as I go ahead and find this final answer. So 2Y minus 7 is equal to 2X minus 6.5. I want to get x alone, so I'm going to add 6.5 to both sides. I get then that 2x is equal to 2y minus 0.5. So to get x alone, we got to divide both sides by 2. We get then that x is equal to y minus 0.25, which is the same thing as 1 fourth. So x is equal to y minus 1 fourth. So that has to be then choice A. So was this question annoying? Yeah, but by just actually scanning through the answers and seeing how we need to express our answer before we walk through the problem, it really does make it a lot easier. So there we go. If you enjoyed today's video, guys, make sure to like, comment, comment some video recommendations, and definitely subscribe to my channel. I'm going to be posting every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, so three times a week, hashtag consistent, woo woo. So again, guys, leave any recs you got in the comments, and thanks so much for watching. I hope you guys learned a ton in this video.